The COVID-19 situation in China is not getting any better. Hospitalizations have jumped almost 50 percent over the past week, and European countries are joining South Korea in applying stricter border measures on travelers from China. Seoul's military says that one of the North Korean drones that crossed into South Korea's airspace last week did enter a no-fly zone. According to the South's intel agency, the North got close enough to potentially have taken pictures of the presidential office. The world's biggest tech show CES 2023 is back with its biggest ever edition. We get a sneak peek at some of the sharpest innovations and most up-to-date technologies. Good morning and welcome to New Day at Arirang. COVID-19 hospitalizations in, in China have jumped nearly 50 percent over the past week. And European countries are also imposing travel measures on visitors from China. Our Yi seung starts us off. According to the World Health Organization on Thursday, COVID-19 hospitalization figures have soared nearly 50 percent over the past week. The date on the weekly status of COVID-19 in China, released by the WHO, shows that the number of new COVID-19 hospitalization in China increased by 46 percent on week. Chinese authorities also say 218,019 new cases of COVID-19 and 648 deaths were reported this week. However, the WHO says it's unclear if the data supplied by China is accurate and that the situation could be even worse. Airfinity, a British medical data analysis company, estimates 2 million COVID-19 cases per day in China and around 10,000 deaths. Despite this, China reaffirmed its stance that it has been transparent with its data. Facts have proven that China has always maintained close communication with the World Health Organization and shared relevant information and data in a timely manner in accordance with the principles of law, timeliness, openness and transparency. In response to growing calls from the EU to its member states to impose stricter travel measures for travelers from China, Germany, Belgium and Sweden are set to mandate COVID-19 testing before entry to their countries. Germany had previously been against such measures on the grounds that a new mutant virus had not yet emerged in China, but sharply changed its stance after the EU recommendation. Heading back, the Chinese foreign ministry says COVID-19 measures should be based on science and facts and that there should be no attempts to politicize the issue or adopt a discriminatory practice that affects regular person-to-person -person exchanges. Lee Seung-jae, Arirang News. The South Korean military has admitted that one of the North Korean drones that intruded into the South's airspace last week entered SARS no-fly zone. It could have also taken close-up pictures of the presidential office. Our Pei eun has more. More than a week after five North Korean drones crossed into the South's airspace last Monday, Seoul's military admitted that one of them had briefly entered the northern end of a no-fly zone. This zone, also known as P-73, has a 3.7-kilometer radius surrounding the presidential office in central Seoul. South Korea's Joint Chiefs of Staff had denied that one of the drones had entered this zone, but reversed its stance on Thursday. The military said that this comes after conducting a detailed analysis on the trajectory of the drone. But it insisted that it did not fly directly over the Yongsan area where the office of President Yoon Sung-yeol is located, and stressed that there are no problems regarding the security of the presidential office. An official from the JCS said because the drone flew about three kilometers from ground and considering its capabilities, the North would not have been able to take close-up photos of the presidential office. But South Korea's National Intelligence Agency said the possibility that the North may have taken photos of it nonetheless cannot be ruled out. We expressed our concerns that pictures of the presidential office in Yongsan may have been taken by North Korea, and the NIS said that is a possibility. Last week's drone intrusion prompted South Korea's military to scramble fighter planes and attack helicopters. But it wasn't able to bring down the drone, allowing them to fly over the capital area for about an hour. To prevent this from happening again, the military said it conducted a drill on Thursday afternoon involving live fire training, using Ka-1 light attack aircraft and Cobra attack helicopters. Through this drill, the Joint Chiefs of Staff and Operating Forces were able to train for classified military operations using aircraft similar to the enemy's drones. 
Thursday's exercise comes about a week after the military staged similar drills to counter drones that did not involve live fire training. Pei Eun Ji, Arirang News. Recent analysis from the U.S. suggests that if North Korean leader Kim Jong Un was to suddenly die, at this point his younger sister Kim Yo Jong would likely be his successor. According to Sumi Terry, director of the Asia program at the Wilson Center at a webinar on leadership in North Korea held by the U.S. think tank CAIS on Thursday, Kim Yo Jong is a second in command and has been exercising real power since 2014. She is also the vice minister of the Workers' Party of Korea. Terry added that because Kim Jong-un's oldest child won't reach adulthood until 2030 at the earliest, his first run would only become leader if Kim died several years from now. The world's largest tech extravaganza, the Consumer Electronics Show, kicked off at Las Vegas on Thursday morning local time. Google, Amazon and Microsoft tech titans that missed the show last year due to the spread of Omicron are back in for CS 2023. So this year's tech event is once again packed and is expected to be back to its pre-pandemic glory. Around 3,000 companies are taking part in the event and its foot traffic is expected to exceed 100,000 visitors. South Korea's tech giants Samsung and LG have also set up giant boots, where LG is touting a giant OLED display with 260 screens. And Samsung is taking up around 3,000 meters square feet, where it has revealed a smart home solution. It's not just big corporations touting their latest technology at CES. Some startups have also gained recognition for their innovative products. From using AI to detect cancer to analyzing skin needs, startups have integrated their latest technology into healthcare. Our Kim Yun Sung reports. No more need for a stethoscope in the medicine cabinet. This is Waymade Cough, a smartphone app that alerts users of their health problems through artificial intelligence. <coughs> so you have to cough and breathe into the screen, and then the app records the sounds. And then artificial intelligence analyzes whether your cough sounds serious enough for you to go see a doctor. So mine says that my cough does sound a bit serious, so it's best that I go see a doctor. This clever technology was developed by Weisen, a Korean startup. But their innovation doesn't end here. They have also come up with easier ways to detect the early stages of cancer. The Weimade Endo spots unusual dents and bumps during an endoscopy, and Weimade Ebus helps detect lung cancer during an endobronchial ultrasound. AI assists medical professionals by finding abnormalities or lesions in real time. The program also has a built-in cooperative diagnosis system so that hospitals that lack resources can share medical strategies with other professionals. Weisen's tech is already in use at a hospital in Vietnam. It also garnered worldwide recognition by becoming the world's first medical AI company to win four innovation awards at CES. And it's not the only Korean startup getting attention in Las Vegas. Out of almost 500 CS Innovation Awards this year, Korean companies bagged close to one-third of them. Startups were in the spotlight, with 34 startups companies scoring 48 awards. Of them, almost half were healthcare products. This Korean startup merges AI with beauty. The company Lululab developed a technology called Lumini, where AI analyzes skin conditions like redness or pores with just several snapshots. The program then gives product recommendations that cater to the user's specific skin needs. And this technology is versatile. It can be used from in-store kiosks to at-home apps. From big corporations to small stores, businesses can expand their profit model by using our technology. An overseas cosmetic brand has added our software into its app so that it leads consumers straight to buying the recommended products. Lulab says that it's building an AI that can diagnose skin allergies and eczema.
its booth and other startup innovations at 2023 CES give a glimpse of the intertwined future of AI and healthcare. Kim Hyun-sung, Arirang News. With K-content becoming a major export engine in South Korea, the government plans to introduce an aggressive budget to further nurture the culture industry. Our Shin Sebyeok has the details. The Ministry of Culture, Sports and Tourism will inject over 6.7 trillion won, or roughly over $5.3 billion, to support South Korean media content this year to further expand K-culture to the world. In a policy briefing to President Yoon sung yeol on Thursday, the culture minister spoke of the importance of nurturing K-content as it has become the country's number one major source of growth. K-content has become the major export growth engine. It will be the game-changer that changes the export landscape of the country. The key agenda out of the six presented includes further promoting K-content. The ministry allocated its largest budget of 790 billion won, worth some $620 million for nurturing promising firms in the industry. In particular, it pledged to provide intensive support to the game industry, which takes up 70 percent of the total content exports. It will also give comprehensive support to promote a variety of online fictional content like online novels and cartoons. Also, the government will provide systematic support to boost production for OTT platforms. Specifically, it will offer over 45 billion won, or nearly 36 million dollars in financial support for movie and TV show production, and 30 billion won for post-production work. Through those efforts, the ministry aims to increase the country's content exports to $15 billion this year and $22 billion by 2027, around a two-fold growth from 2021. Another major pillar of the 2023 work plan involves reviving tourism through the rising popularity of K-culture. To do so, the government plans to declare the year 2023 as the year of visit Korea and hold tourism roadshows in 15 big cities around the world. The ministry will also work to create a cluster for history and culture-themed tourism centered around the formal presidential compound of Tongwade and surrounding old neighborhood. Detailed plans are yet to be made, but the ministry said the advisory committee will come up with a concrete plan soon. Other plans include supporting local areas that lack cultural opportunities and supporting artists with disabilities, such as opening a barrier-free performance arts hall. Shin Sebyeok, Arirang News. Winter not only brings chills and freezing temperatures, but is also the prime season for cold and flu. Type A influenza is among the most unwelcome visitors at this time of the year. For more on this, we now turn to Dr. Gwak. He's an assistant professor at the, of the International Clinic at Suncheonhyang University. Good morning, Dr. Gwak. Good morning. All right, so let's start with the definition of type A influenza. What is type A influenza and what are the symptoms that we can uh, help uh, with the diagnosis of the virus? Well, type A influenza virus is uh, one of the four main types of influenza viruses that is actually uh, that is common to uh, our knowledge, um, t uh, namely type A, B, and C, and D. C's and D's normally do not infect humans, so we're not completely concerned about that. But type A and B are the most common ones they usually find among ourselves, especially type A compared to the other one, type B is the one that can spread even further and uh, happens to have caused pandemic in, in, in the prior days. Uh, namely, type A and type uh, of influenza was originated from swine flu, uh, namely H1N1 type of uh, influenza virus. Uh, the first time we've ever found it was in a 10-year-old uh, child back in uh, 2009 uh, that came up with fevers and chills and uh, the, the common types of um, 
uh, the uh, influenza symptoms. Uh, and time has passed and it's created a bunch of different epidemics. And what's interesting about this type of influenza is that it uh, sort of recombinates its DNA to cause different types of antigens, meaning every year or so we have to come up with a new type of uh, vaccine that could fight against this particular virus. Um, so uh, it usually spreads among um, uh, respiratory uh, types of methods. So uh, every winter or uh, uh, early springs is the time that we usually get hit with the epidemics of type A influenza. Uh, the symptoms include anything from fevers and chills, uh, headaches, muscle aches, and getting tired, fatigued, and sneezing to uh, very common symptoms like sore throat and coughing. So it clearly overlaps with all other types of respiratory illnesses that we usually have during the season as well. So considering it was found back in 2009, the virus is relatively new. That's pretty interesting. And also... That's correct. Right, right, yeah. And how is influenza A virus different from coronavirus? Because it sounds like the symptoms over, seem to overlap quite much. So how can we distinguish the, between the two? Well, there's no clear way of distinguishing uh, between type A influenza and COVID-19 uh, just by looking at a person and judging from a symptom. Because as you've mentioned, uh, these symptoms clearly overlap. They're actually pretty much the same, coming up with sore throat, uh, showing a bunch of uh, different respiratory symptoms, getting tired from it, and headaches. The only biggest difference clinically that we can um, uh, seem to observe is that it's duration and it's duration of infectivity and also it's uh, uh, the time of being to the point of infectivity differs a little bit. Uh, type A influenza is comparatively shorter uh, in its lifespan uh, compared to that of COVID-19. So we usually say a person is able to infect others uh, uh, when symptomatic uh, up to about three to five days. And also the person is uh, seemingly seem to infect others one day prior to coming up with the symptom as opposed to COVID-19 being able to infect other people once having the symptom up to about seven to nine days. And we've actually seen some people infecting others up to even two weeks or three weeks after uh, coming up with the symptom. And COVID-19 also seemingly is able to infect other people uh, three days prior to uh, beginning of the symptom. So only differences in the duration and uh, the beginning of the symptom is probably what distinguishes type A influenza from COVID-19. But other than that, if a person was to come into a clinic with uh, these uh, very common cold, common cold symptoms, I would not be able to distinguish them until I give them the person antigen test for both of the uh, uh, viruses. Sure, that's when we need to turn to you, Dr. Guac. And last but not least, how can we protect ourselves from actually catching the flu? I mean, what can we do other than practicing he healthy habits like washing our hands and uh, regularly and covering our mouths when sneezing? Well, it's, it's obviously um, keeping the most um, conservative hygienic measures. If a person wants to have um, uh, come up with the, the symptom for common cold, it, it's, it's courteous for the person to start wearing masks when the person is uh, either leaving their household premises. But also uh, washing the hands, keeping certain distances, uh, covering your mouth and nose at the same time when you're sneezing and coughing. Those are all the measures that we need to obviously take. But uh, once again, as with COVID-19, uh, vaccinations is, is probably the one uh, top uh, effective uh, measure that we can uh, take in, in protection against these types of viruses because namely these viruses are all pretty much respiratory. Uh, there is no way of completely being able to uh, be protected of, of, of from these viruses once when we start to actually go outside and uh, take on our daily uh, activities and lives. So uh, by being vaccinated, it has a clear medicinal effect to create these antibodies that would 
uh, uh, modify and uh, better enable our immunity to fight against these uh, certain types of viruses. So were we to be exposed to the same type of situation, the person who is vaccin uh, vaccinated would be much better able to uh, fight against uh, the virus. So I would strongly recommend uh, getting vaccinated against um, uh, not just COVID-19, but also influenza if, the, uh, if anyone hasn't received their, their vaccines yet. All right, thank you for your tips, Dr. Guag. And also, thank you for joining us this morning. Thank you, my pleasure. For a look at the news from around the world, we now turn to our Matthew Ashley standing by at the Arirang News Center. Good morning, Matthew. Good morning, Dami. Let's start with the latest on the funeral proceedings of former Pope Benedict XVI as he was finally laid to rest on Thursday morning local time. Well, that's right. Pope Benedict's funeral mass was attended by around 50,000 people. It comes after a three-day wake at St. Peter's Basilica that saw over 200,000 pay their respects. Now, the funeral mass was led by Pope Benedict's successor, Pope Francis, marking the first time in the modern age that a current pope has eulogized a retired one. Now, among the attendees were German President Frank-Walter Steinmeier and Italian President Sergio Mattarella. In accordance to his wishes, Pope Benedict's body was buried in the crypt under St. Peter's Basilica. Pope Benedict died on New Year's Eve at the age of 95, after stepping down due to health reasons a decade earlier. Moving over to the war in Ukraine, as Russian President Vladimir Putin has ordered his forces to observe a 36-hour-long ceasefire beginning Friday local time, and this to mark the Orthodox Christmas holiday, which celebrates Christmas on January 7th. According to the Kremlin's official website, the ceasefire takes into consideration a large number of residents in conflict-hit areas who are of the Orthodox faith. The order marks the first time since the 11-month conflict began that the Russian leader has directed his troops to stop fighting. Kyiv rejected Russia's request to respond in kind, with Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky calling the ceasefire an attempt to stop the advancement of Ukrainian forces. Now, online retailer Amazon has expanded its layoffs to now include some 18,000 employees, the largest job cuts in the company's history. This according to a message to employees sent on Wednesday. The figure is an expansion from its ongoing layoffs of 10,000 employees from mid-November to early January. While previously jobs in the devices and book sector faced the axe, the new layoffs will impact those in human resources and retail. They will start later this month as Amazon looks to cut operating costs amid a slowdown in profits. The company saw a boom in sales during the pandemic, which has since slowed on the back of lower consumer spending due to the cost of living crisis. And finally, stunning allegations by Prince Harry have been revealed in his new autobiography, Spare, after a Spanish version of the book was mistakenly released a week early. Among the many bombshells, one claims that Harry was physically attacked by his older brother and heir to the British throne, Prince William, in 2019, allegedly after arguing over Harry's wife, Meghan Markle. Both Buckingham Palace and Kensington Palace have refused to comment on the alleged incident. The book is also said to contain claims that Prince Harry begged his father not to marry Camilla, now the Queen Consort. This over fears she would be a, quote, wicked stepmother.
Good morning. It's Swan today, the fifth winter term, and it's supposed to be the coldest time of the year around now. And I mean, we've already had enough of freezing weather this winter. For today, instead of icy temperatures, we need to be aware of toxic smog with snow forecasts in the evening. Those in Gyeongsangdo provinces and surrounding regions are seeing very bad air quality this morning and will see through the morning with an ultra-fine dust advisory being issued there. Either snow or rain will fall around the evening commute, especially in Gangwon-do province, which could see up to 10 centimeters of snowfall. The rest of the country could see 1 to 8 centimeters with the snow letting up tomorrow morning. Be careful on the roads, but you know, due to warmer than average seasonal temperatures, there shouldn't be a much of a problem outside. Afternoon highs will be 3 to 4 degrees higher than norms today. We should have bearable winter temperatures for a while, but dust levels will be unbearable. With that in mind, here's a look at the weather conditions around the globe. That wraps up today's New Day at Arirang. We'll be back next week for Monday's edition at the same time. Happy Friday!